Good afternoon. We're studying chapter 8, or lesson 8, the Abrahamic Covenant in the Bible in the Light of Our Redemption by E.W. Kenyon. This book is available on Amazon and I highly recommend it. It's, it's a great foundational study of um, getting, our, getting our foundation built under us from of biblical studies. So this week we're studying the Abrahamic Covenant. In our study of the preceding lessons, we saw that after man died spiritually, his need of a mediator, righteousness, and eternal life could be met only by the incarnation of God's Son. In the last lesson, we traced the working of the grace of God from the time he gave to man the promise of the incarnation to the time of the flood in his preserving a righteous line through which the Redeemer could come. We saw that Satan, in his effort to make the incarnation an impossibility, corrupted humanity to the extent that the flood became imperative. Noah, who knew God, was spared, along with his family, and he preserved the true faith in Jehovah and handed it to his sons. We remember that there were two means Satan used to thwart the purpose of God in the incarnation. He tries to destroy the knowledge of God upon the earth, and he tries to destroy the righteous line. Next, we're going to study the Tower of Babel. From the time of the flood until the building of the Tower of Babel, there was worship of God. Not that all men accepted it, for many wickedly rebelled against it. But the knowledge and revelation of the true God was too fresh in their minds for them to set up other gods. We notice that in the ninth chapter of Genesis, a command had been given to replenish the earth. Chapter 9, verse 1 of Genesis says, And God blessed Noah and his sons, and said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and, rep and replenish the earth. In the eleventh chapter of Genesis, we see that the whole earth was of one language and one speech. The unity of the race was untouched. The ark in which Noah and his family were preserved had rested in Armenia. As men began to multiply, this barren tableland no longer sufficed. Men must either separate and fill the earth, as God told them to do, or a more fertile territory must be found if they are to remain together. The latter course was resolved upon, so they passed down into the rich, fertile lowlands in the plain of Shinar. Genesis 11, 2. Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 and 2 says, And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. They resolved upon a permanent settlement there in order to build a city and a tower that they might not be scattered abroad upon the face of the earth. Genesis 11:4 says, And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Jehovah came down and confounded their language, which caused their being scattered over the earth. Genesis 11, 7 through 9 says, Come, let us go down there and confuse their language so that they will not understand one another's speech. So from there the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth, and they stopped building the city. Therefore its name is called Babylon. For there the Lord confused the language of the whole earth, and from there the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. So from there the streams of population poured forth to all parts of the world northwest to Europe, west to Asia Minor, southwest to Egypt and Africa, south to Arabia, southeast to Persia and India, and east to China. Of course, this was not the work of a day. It took ages and ages for the more distant lands to be settled. After men had been scattered, the worship and knowledge of, Je of Jehovah passed into the worship of the powers of nature and then into idols. Sense knowledge took the place of God's revelation, which had been given to spiritually dead man. The oldest sacred books and traditions of each nation bear witness to the account in the scripture that each nation originally possessed a revelation of God. 
Romans 1, 18 through 32 says, For God's wrath is revealed from heaven against all godlessness and unrighteousness of people who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Since what can be known about God is evident among them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, that is, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen since the creation of the world, being understood through what he has made. As a result, people are without excuse. For though they knew God, they did not glorify him as God or show gratitude. Instead, their thinking became nonsense, and their senseless minds were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man, birds, four-footed animals, and reptiles. Therefore God delivered them over in the cravings of their hearts to sexual impurity, so that their bodies were degraded among themselves. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and worshipped and served something created instead of the Creator, who is praised forever. Amen. This is why God delivered them over to degrading passions. For even their females exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. The males in the same way also left natural relations with females and were inflamed in their lust for one another. Males committed shameless acts with males and received in their own persons the appropriate penalty of their error. And because they did not think it worthwhile to acknowledge God, God delivered them over to a worthless mind to do what is morally wrong. They are filled with all unrighteousness, evil, greed, and wickedness. They are full of envy, murder, quarrels, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, arrogant, proud, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, and unmerciful although they know full well God's just sentence, that those who practice such things deserve to die. They not only do them, but even applaud others who practice them. From these ancient writings and traditions, with the aid of monumental inscriptions, we can get quite a clear picture of the passing from the worship of one God into the worship of many gods and of many idols. Then we look at the call of Abraham. 367 years after the flood, Abraham appears. Noah was alive for 50 years after the birth of Abraham. The world had lapsed into idolatry. Abraham lived among pagans and idolaters until he was 75 years old. He had been born and had lived in Ur of the Chaldees, one of the most splendid ancient cities until he received his call from God. We can understand why God revealed himself to Abraham. The revelation of God was practically lost. If a righteous line were to be preserved through which God could send his incarnate son, he must choose one man who knew him and make of him a nation that would preserve the knowledge of himself upon the earth. Abraham's countrymen and his father were idolaters. If, in him, a nation was to be founded that would preserve God's revelation to man and a knowledge of man's Redeemer so that he would be recognized when he came, it was necessary for Abraham to be removed from these influences. There are many legends that tell of Abraham's being persecuted for his refusal to worship idols. So under a call of God, he set out in search of a land where a nation could be founded free from idolatry. And it says to read Genesis 12 to find the, the complete story of that. 25 years after Abraham had received his call from God, the greatest event in human history until the birth of Christ took place. It was the blood covenant into which Jehovah and Abraham entered. Before we can understand the significance of this covenant that God cut with Abraham, we must know the meaning of the blood covenant. The blood covenant existed before Abraham. Proofs of the existence of this rite of blood covenanting have been found among primitive peoples of every quarter of the globe, and its antiquity is carried back to, the, to a date long prior to the days of Abraham. The blood covenant. It is evident that God cut the covenant or entered into a covenant with Adam at the very beginning. 
A common revelation of the blood covenant from God must have been given to primitive man. We saw the scattering of man at the Tower of Babel. Noah evidently must have possessed a knowledge of the significance of the blood covenant that he handed to his children, so that as the nations were formed from the dispersion at the Tower of Babel, each one possessed a knowledge of the blood covenant. We believe this because of the following facts that are revealed in Henry Clay Trumbull's book, The Blood Covenant. Henry Clay Trumbull was an American clergyman and author that lived from 1830 to 1903. And in his book, it says, From the very beginning and everywhere, blood seems to have been looked upon as preeminently the representative of life, as indeed, in a peculiar sense, life itself. The transference of blood from one organism to another has been counted the transference of life, with all that life includes. The intercommingling of blood by its inner transference has been understood as equivalent to the intercommingling of natures. Two natures thus intercommingled by the intercommingling of blood have been considered as forming thenceforward one blood, one life, one nature, one soul in two organisms. The intercommingling of natures by the intercommingling of blood has been deemed possible between man and a lower organism and between man and a higher organism, even between man and deity, actually or by symbol, as well as between man and his immediate fellow. A covenant of blood, a covenant made by the intercommingling of blood, has been recognized as the closest, the holiest, and most indissoluble compact conceivable. There are three reasons for men cutting the covenant with each other. Number one, if a strong tribe lives by the side of a weaker tribe and there is danger of the weaker tribe being destroyed, the weaker will seek to cut the covenant with the stronger tribe that they may be preserved. Two, if two parties want to go into business together and one is going to leave the country and travel as a foreign representative, a covenant will be cut between the partners. And three, if two men love each other as devotedly as David and Jonathan, they will cut the covenant. The moment the blood covenant is solemnized, everything that a blood covenant man owns is at the disposal of his blood brother. Yet this brother would never ask for anything unless he were absolutely driven by want to do it. Another feature is that as soon as this covenant is cut, they are called by others the blood brothers. That blood covenant goes down through the generations. It is an indissoluble covenant that generations cannot erase. If a man cuts the covenant with his friend, the children of the two families are bound to observe it. If two men in Africa cut the covenant, as Mr. Stanley tells us and Dr. Livingstone bears witness, and one man should break the covenant, his nearest relatives would seek his death, for no man can live in Africa who breaks the covenant. He curses the round. There is nothing that is absolutely sacred with us, but in Africa the covenant is sacred. Mr. Stanley and Dr. Livingstone both testify that they never knew the covenant to be broken. Henry Stanley was a missionary that lived from 1841 to 1904, and David Livingstone lived from 1813 to 1817, 1873, and they were both missionaries into Africa. The method of cutting the covenant is practically the same the world over. In some places, it has degenerated into a very grotesque rite, but it is the same blood covenant. The method that is practiced by the Africans, Arabians, Syrians, and Balkans is this. Number one, two men who wish to cut the covenant come together with friends and a priest. Second, they exchange gifts. Then they bring a cup of wine. Third, the priest makes an incision in the arm of each man, allowing the blood to drip into the wine. And fourth, finally, then they mingle the wine and drink it. Now they are blood brothers. The Abrahamic Covenant. In the 17th chapter of Genesis, it takes on new meaning for us now. We see that when God appeared to Abraham to make a covenant with him, Abraham knew what it meant. God was coming into a covenant of strong friendship with him. 
the blood covenant was called the covenant of strong friendship. That is why Abraham was called the friend of God. We see that in James 2, 23, which says, And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. In Isaiah 41, 8, it says, But you, Israel, my servant Jacob, whom I have chosen, descendant of Abraham, my friend. Second Chronicles 20, verse 7 Art not thou our God, who did drive out the inhabitants of this land before thy people Israel, and gave it to the seed of Abraham, thy friend, forever? And so we see in those three verses that Abraham was called the friend of God, and it was because of the blood covenant. Abraham is the only human being who was called the friend of God in the Old Testament. The covenant God cut with Abraham was to bring the Israelite nation into being as a covenant people. Genesis 17, 7 says, I will keep my covenant between me and you and your future offspring throughout their generations as an everlasting covenant to be your God and the God of your offspring after you. Then God gave to Abraham the method of cutting the covenant. In Genesis 17, 10 through 14, it says, This is my covenant, which you are to keep. Between me and you and your offspring after you, every one of your males must be circumcised. You must circumcise the flesh of your foreskin to serve as a sign of the covenant between me and you. Throughout your generations, every male among you at eight days old is to be circumcised. This includes a slave born in your house and one purchased with money from any foreigner the one who is not your offspring. A slave born in your house as well as one purchased with money must be circumcised. My covenant will be marked in your flesh as an everlasting covenant. If any male is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that man will be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. So the seal of the covenant was circumcision. Every male child was circumcised at the age of eight days and that circumcision was the entrance into the covenant. Genesis 17:26 says, In the selfsame day, Abraham was circumcised, and afterward he bore in his flesh the evidence that he had entered into the blood covenant of friendship with God. To this day, Abraham is designated in the East as the friend of God. And I actually took Genesis 17:23 through 27. And it says, Then Abraham took his son Ishmael, and all the slaves born in his house or purchased with his money, every male among the members of Abraham's household. And he circumcised the flesh of their foreskin on that very day, just as God had said to him. Abraham was 99 years old when the flesh of his foreskin was circumcised, and his son Ishmael was 13 years old when the flesh of his foreskin was circumcised. On that same day, Abraham and his son Ishmael were circumcised, and all the men of his household, both slaves born in his house and those purchased with money from a foreigner, were circumcised with him. After the formal covenant of blood had been cut between God and Abraham, there came a testing of Abraham's fidelity to that covenant. This testing would also give evidence to the future generations that the cutting of the covenant on the part of Abraham in the rite of circumcision had not been an empty ceremony, but that in that he had pledged his very life to Jehovah. <coughs> Genesis 15, 6 says, And he, Abram, believed in, trusted in, relied on, remained steadfast to the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness, right standing with God. The Hebrew word hemim here translated believed in carries the idea that an unqualified committal of oneself to another. Abraham so trusted Jehovah that he was ready to commit himself to Jehovah as in the right of the blood covenant. Therefore God counted Abraham's spirit of loving and longing trust as ready for a blood covenant friendship between them. The testing came when Isaac a blood covenant child that God had miraculously given to Abraham 
was somewhere between 18 and 20 years old. Abraham's testing, Genesis 22, 1 through 2. It came to pass after these things that God did prove Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Here am I. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son, whom thou love, even Isaac, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. And Abraham rose instantly to respond to the call of his divine friend. <coughs> Just here, it is well to recognize the Asian thought in a transaction like this. An Asian father prizes an only son more than he prizes his own life. For an Asian father to die without a son is a terrible thought, but with a son to take his place, he is ready to die. For Abraham to have surrendered his own toil-worn life, now that a son of promise had been born to him, it would have been a minor matter at the call of God. But for Abraham to surrender that son and to become again a hopeless, childless old man was a different matter. Only a faith that would neither reason nor question, only a love that would neither fail nor waver could meet an issue like that. All the world over, men in the covenant of blood friendship were ready to give that which was dearer than life itself to their blood covenant brothers or their gods. Would Abraham do as much for his divine friend as men would do for their human friends? Would Abraham surrender to his God all that the worshipers of other gods were willing to surrender in proof of their devotedness? These were questions to be answered before the world. Abraham showed himself capable of even such friendship as this in his blood covenant with Jehovah. Genesis 22, 3-10 says, So Abraham got up early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took with him two of his young men and his son Isaac. He split wood for a burnt offering and set out to go to the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go over there to worship, then we'll come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac. In his hand he took the fire and the sacrificial knife, and the two of them walked on together. Then Isaac spoke to his father Abraham and said, My father, and he replied, Here I am, my son. Isaac said, The fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. Then the two of them walked on together. When they arrived at the place that God had told him about, Abraham built the altar there and arranged the wood. He bound his son Isaac and placed him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out and took the knife to slaughter his son. And it says, And when he had manifested his spirit of devotedness, he was told to stay his hand. Hebrews 11, 17 through 19 says, By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. He received the promises, and he was offering his unique son. The one it had been said about, Your seed will be traced through Isaac. He considered God to be able even to raise someone from the dead, and as an illustration, he received him back. Then it was said that the angel of Jehovah called unto Abraham a second time out of heaven and said, By myself have I sworn by my life. Genesis 22, 15 through 16. And it says, Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn. This is the Lord's declaration, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your only son. I will indeed bless you and make your offspring as numerous as the stars of the sky and the sand on the seashore. Your offspring will possess the gates of their enemies. Here is the foundation of that covenant, Godward. There was nothing that God could swear by except himself. To the Asian mindset, it meant, I swear by myself. Now if this fails, I become your slave. You own me. I put myself in bondage to you. They are bound together. All that God is 
belongs to Abraham, and all that Abraham is or ever will have belongs to God in this covenant relationship. Now you can understand why so many times he said, I am Jehovah who keepeth covenants. He is the covenant-keeping God. Back behind Israel was this solemn covenant that God had sealed on his side by putting himself in utter, absolute bondage to that covenant. Oftentimes, um, there is so much misunderstanding about, you know, the, the Lord's Supper. When Jesus said, this is my body and this is my blood. But the people that were there with him had that solemn understanding of that blood covenant that we today don't necessarily understand without studying the foundational roots of the meanings of these things like we are through this book. Um, it, it, brings, it, it brings a whole new level of meaning into the Lord's Supper and the blood of Jesus. And when we say, you know, we're covered by the blood of Jesus, it's, it's because we're, we are um, adopted, but children of Abraham. And um, because we are children of Abraham, we get the benefits of that blood covenant that was between God and Abraham and was fulfilled in Jesus, who was the sacrifice. So we'll see you next week with Lesson 9. Thank you. Have a good evening.